Hi, my name is Daryl Peterson and I'm the manager of the Applications Engineering Department here at MicroMeasurements. This afternoon, I've got one of my colleagues, uh, Paul Millard, who's a senior Applications Engineer and he's here to help me run this data acquisition system. Uh, this is the 7100 system, which is our one of our latest uh, data acquisition systems for inputs such as strain gauges, uh, thermocouples, LEDs, and more. Uh, the reason we're going to be using it, though, is we want to illustrate what are the new products that we've recently come out with. And this is a strain gauge. It looks much like any other strain gauge, but it has some unique characteristics. And that unique characteristic is the fact that it's a 5,000 ohm strain gauge. And one of the things we'd like to do is illustrate some of the advantages of using 5,000 ohm strain gauges over a more traditional strain gauge uh, that's 350 ohms. So today what we've got set up is we've got the, the system 7100. Paul's gonna be running the computer and we have two inputs. And these inputs are strain gauges that are mounted onto these uh, Lexan or polycarbonate beams. We've got a 5,000 ohm gauge, we've got a 350 ohm strain gauge. And what we're gonna do is vary the excitation and see how stable uh, these strain gauges are. Uh, oftentimes when you're installing gauges on a material like a composite or a ceramic or maybe a plastic, mm -hmm. uh, you find that you really have to watch the excitation values because strain gauges will act like any other resistor. If you put too much current into them, you start to develop heat and heat can lead to an unstable signal. So in this case, what we're gonna illustrate is how these two strain gauges, they're identical in size. The only difference is one is 5,000 ohms and the other is 350 ohms, and we're gonna illustrate what happens to them when you put a low excitation into the gauge, and then if you uh, go to a higher excitation. And right now, we're gonna start with a one volt excitation, and we're gonna work our way to powering these with a 10 volt excitation. So I guess with that being said, we're gonna go ahead and get started. So we've got the 7100, the two strain gauges, Paul's got the computer, and we're gonna set up the uh, sensors and the first one, I guess, let's go ahead and set up. This one is the 350 ohm. So the part number for this 350 ohm strain gauge is a C5K-06-125F. And the part number for the 350 ohm gauge is a C5K-06-125F. And the strain smart software that's used to control the 7100, you can input all that information into it. And another important aspect is right now, we are starting with a one volt excitation because we want to start low and then work our way up. And then now we're going to input the properties for the second gauge, and this is the 5,000 ohm one, and this was the new one. It's a C5K-06-125 LK-50 C. And it has a gauge factor of 2.04. And if you had a package of these and you look on the engineering data for it, you'll see that the resistance in this case is 5,000 ohms plus or minus 0.2%. And you might be asking yourself, why does that make a difference? Well, we're gonna to try to answer that question at least in part uh, with this video. So Paul has the two strain gauges uh, created. Uh, the next thing that he's gonna do is to uh, take this system and bring it online. He's got the, the computer is set up. He's going to connect. And basically, this is the point where StrainSmart and a computer shakes hands with the 7100 scanner. Okay. And then once he does that, now he's going to assign the strain gauges to channels of this box. Now, we have had to make a small modification to the 7100 scanner in order for it to accept the 5,000 ohm strain gauge. And all we've had to do is to pull one of the cards out and replace a bridge completion resistor that's dry socketed. That bridge completion resistor is 1,000 ohms. We reach in there, we take it out, and we replace it with a 5,000 ohm resistor, and that will allow the Wheatstone bridge to balance. And we've done it on channel one. So channel one needs to be the 5,000 ohm strain gauge. Okay. And then channel two will be the 350. So again, we're just assigning the properties of the sensor to the particular channels. 
We're gonna start out with a one volt excitation. Both of these are set up as quarter bridges. Okay. All right, so really now, uh, the next step is to create a scan session in the software. So we're gonna, we're gonna tell it how fast we wanna scan and record, which in this case, uh, this box can go up to 2,000 samples per second, but we don't need to go that fast for this test. We're just gonna set it to maybe 10 samples a second. I think that's fast enough, unless you yeah, disagree. Fine. Okay, 10 samples a second, and we're gonna do time-based recording uh, so we can capture that signal. All set. Once you set up the scan <coughs> session, really the next thing to do is to zero balance it. So this is the point where you wanna make sure that your, your beams, your hardware, your parts, where the gauges are installed, you've got it unloaded. Uh, they're just laying here on the, the table. So Paul is gonna zero it. Everything looks good. All right. One of the nice things about StrainSmart is it'll report back what the offsets are. And you can see that both of these offsets are relatively small. One's about 2,000 uh, counts. The other one's about 727. And both of those are relatively low within the normal uh, resistance tolerance uh, provided by the strain gauges. So that looks good. Arm and scan. So now we're going to arm it. <clears throat> and then he's going to start scanning. Arming is when the, the computer basically passes information over to the scanner to tell it what we want it to do, such as how fast to record and what channels to record. And then he's going to click on the scan button and now it's actually, it starts to run. So with our data acquisition systems, scanning and recording are actually two different things. Now in our case, we're gonna scan and record at the exact same rate, but you don't have to do that if you don't want to. You could scan really fast and, and very slowly record if you want to, to try to maybe make a, a smaller file size. Uh, but the other thing we wanna do is we wanna watch it. So Paul's gonna open up the online data viewer and when he does that, that will give us a chance to be able to look at the data and let's see how stable it is. Again, what, one of the things we're chasing after is, is what is the right excitation level for these size strain gauges mounted on the materials that aren't very good conductors of heat. Uh, this Lexan's a very good insulator. And what that really means is we've got to watch that excitation. So right now, again, we're running at one volt. Paul's got it set up on a strip chart. Now we can see it, our axis width is one minute. The resolution on this display is, uh, right now the range on the display is from zero to, to two microstrain. We're widening it out just a little bit so you get a little bit better perspective on it. But we're looking at essentially zero and one microstrain. And that's one of the powerful parts of our data acquisition system is the ability to resolve very low uh, strain gauge type measurements very well in terms of the overall stability. Now we are going at 10 samples a second, so we're recording quite slow, but this box could go up to 2,000 readings a second if we wanted it to. Now we're going to watch it here for just a couple more, couple more seconds. But basically what I see, and Paul, you agree, disagree, I see a pretty stable input. Both cages look good. So at this point, really, what, what this tells us is that this size strain gauge, whether it's in a 350 or a 5,000 ohm resistance, and you bond them on the plastic, uh, you could run them both at one volt, and, and they're quite stable. They haven't changed. Uh, but what we find is a lot of times our customers have systems that maybe maybe they don't have a one volt selection. Uh, maybe it's fixed at five volts. Oh, yeah. Maybe it's even fixed at 10 volts. Or you might find that you're battling noise. And one of the unique things about Wheatstone Bridge circuits is that the more input voltage you have, the more output signal you get. So if you, if you find that you've got some noisy inputs, one of the things you might have to do is increase that excitation to increase that output. So my point to that is, while one volt looks pretty good and pretty stable, you may find that your applications won't allow you to do that, either through hardware limitations or maybe the, the overall noise level in the measurement. So what we're gonna illustrate now is we're gonna try increasing that excitation. What do you think? You think we ought to go ahead and push it up to 
Yeah. Push it all the way to 10. So we're gonna bump it up to 10 volts and then see what these two gauges do then. See if we can see a difference between that 350 and that 5000. So to do that, we're gonna stop the scanning and recording. We have to go back into the configuration file to uh, change the excitation. Uh, remember it was set at one and now we're gonna bump it up uh, to 10. Before that, I also repeated the scan session. So the original zeros are gonna be retained. Yeah, perfect. So uh, you can save a little bit of time by duplicating the scan session. So you maintain your original zeros and you don't have to walk back through all those steps. It'll very quickly uh, build you a new scan session. You wanna to go to 10? I say, let's do it. Let's push it to 10. Okay. That's the 350 ohm string gauge. Which I might should have done second. That's all right. Now, one of the things we're trying to do is we're trying to move relatively quick because we know when we put 10 volts on these gauges on plastic, we're, we're kind of expecting a little bit of instability that we didn't see with a one volt excitation. So Paul's trying to move quickly through the steps. Uh, he's already started the uh, scanning. And I seem to have lost the x-axis. I'm trying to find the x-axis. There we go. Let's try it. There we go. Sorry about that. So right now we're watching it. Wow. Oops. What do we see? Um, I've got it auto fit on the Y axis. And so whoever yellow is, he's climbing up pretty rapidly. Um, and the time that it took me to get back over to the plot, he's up over 700 microstrain, now shooting for 800 microstrain. So, so let's talk about that for a second. So the yellow graph is the 350 ohm strain gauge. So yep. identical gauges, same material as before. The only change we've made is increase that excitation to 10 volts. And with that 350 ohm strain gauge on that piece of plastic, we're getting nearly an 800 microstrain shift. You know, and if you're in a, a real application where you're trying to measure strain and you're putting them on maybe composites or plastics, and man, if you get an 800 microstrain shift, that could be a problem. Think about it. If you're trying to measure 800 and you got 800 microstrain a shift, you know, your, your error is essentially equivalent to the magnitude that you're trying to measure. So what do you do to try to fix that? Well, let's talk about using the 5,000 ohm strain gauge. The 5,000 ohm gauge is the red graph. And if we look at it, boy, it's awfully close to zero. Maybe a little bit, a little bit of shift. I can't tell what the magnitude of that is, but boy, it sure is close to zero. Maybe it's about, let's say 15 counts maybe. Yeah. Some of that offset can also be because we changed the excitation voltage, which changes the gain too. So there's a little bit of shifting, but in, also in comparison versus time, you can see that it's a far more stable strain gauge. The self-heating isn't continuing to happen. It's not having difficulty. And also, even though the 350 ohm strain gauge seems to decrease its rate of, of, of uh, increased strain, uh, it's still acting unstable as it has difficulty dissipating that heat down into a what's effectively a, an insulator, thermal insulator, rather than uh, a conductor. So it's not unusual for our customers. They're used to using a, a certain size strain gauge and they're used to driving 10 volts on the strain gauge um, on aluminum, on a good heat sink. And suddenly they have to use that gauge on plastic. And this graph would represent potentially the differences between the two heat sinks. But um, it also exhibits that if you switch to a higher resistance gauge like 5,000 ohms on your plastic, you get much more of the behavior you're used to to make a good measurement. Yeah, so to, to sort of summarize that, just like Paul said, um, if you're on plastics, composites, materials that in general are not good heat sinks, and in particular too, if you needed to go to a smaller size gauge, one of the the, the big advancements we've had at MicroMeasurements uh, in the past few years is the ability to manufacture gauges in smaller sizes and much higher resistances than ever before. And now we've got a range of 5,000 ohm strain gauges that are intended for stress analysis purposes. 
So when you look at your application, you think about what the materials are and the size of the strain gauge. And in particular, if you're on materials that aren't very good conductors of heat, you really want to consider using uh, some of these higher resistance gauges, including the 5,000 ohms. Because in this particular case, as we've shown, the amount of self-heating you get is very, very small, almost not detectable compared to what you would get with a similar size 350 ohm strain gauge. Anything else you want to add to that? No, hit the nail on the head. Um, if we can just uh, get folks using the high resistance gauges, I think they'd be a whole lot happier with the results. All right, if you guys would like to find out more about these 5,000 ohm strain gauges, uh, please feel free to take a look at our website at www.micro-measurements.com or give us a call at 919-365-3800 and follow the prompts till you get to Applications Engineering and we'd be happy to answer any questions related to these gauges or any other gauges for that matter. Thank you and have a good day. Thanks, Paul. Sure.